Uh, next up, we have James Wallace, Sarah Konigsberg, and Emily Fairfax from the Beaver Trust in England and Wales, the United Kingdom. And they will be talking about beavers without borders. So at this time, I'd like to welcome James. Hi, everybody. I have one slide, and that's it. You'll be released in here. Lots of slides today. I thought I'd go light on it. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for welcoming uh, an Englishman. As you've been hearing earlier on, we're a bit slow on the uptake in the beaver world, and uh, we need a bit of patience. I'd also ask for patience with me. Um, I have been completely honest with you, I haven't slept a week uh, having a bit of jet lag, so forgive me. My job here, according to Mike Callahan, uh, when he invited me to speak, was to come and uh, talk about collaboration and and um, and how we can all work together and that's what I'm going to do but I apologize if I'm a little bit jaded. Uh, after speaking for a few minutes uh, Sarah and uh, Jacob as well and Emily are going to come up and talk a little bit about their opinion on th this subject. So um, I'd just like to ask a question I think I pretty much know the answer to it but could you just put your hands up if you really believe that we are in a climate and ecological emergency? Right, thank you. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> oh, two hands there, thank you. Brilliant. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a background in, in setting up environmental organisations and uh, over the past 20 years been involved in well, quite a range of different things. Deep sea exploration using manned submersibles, uh, climate change communications on and off for the past most of those 20 years and um, ecotourism, city centre regeneration, clean technology and fundraising both for profit and not for profit and over the past uh, four, four or five years I've been focusing mostly on conservation and nature restoration and prior to setting up the Beaver Trust uh, established an organisation called uh, Necton which was the deep ocean research um, and the expeditions we did there and was helping to run an organisation called Blue Ventures and if you're into tropical marine conservation, you won't find many beavers there, but I can highly recommend you look into them, they're a good bunch. So, um, my background, well, I, I'm an archaeologist originally, and unlike all you scientists in the room, I'm not a real scientist. I studied it uh, as an undergrad, and I, uh, I didn't get a very good grade. Uh, had a lot of fun, and um, fell in love with archaeology. And interestingly for me, when I was an undergrad, I was invited to excavate the Olympic rowing lake that you may have watched on telly in 2012. Uh, this was back in 1994. And the, uh, the site director, Tim Allen, gathered, oh, I don't know, one or 200 students. It's a huge excavation, the biggest in English history. And um, there we were, one hot sunny day. And little, little did we expect as we were excavating a paleo channel. So if you can imagine the River Thames as we see it today, I should think quite a few of you have either been there or, or at least seen it. It's a wide, slow moving, moving river and it's heavily managed. You know, it's concreted and bricked up and revetted all the way along. Back in the uh, Neolithic, it was a very different type of river. And we were excavating a paleo channel. And as we were going back, if you can imagine the face going, as we were cutting through, we saw a dark staining coming across and over the course of about a day or two, worked our way to the conclusion that it was a beaver dam. Now that was quite a big surprise because I'd just spent two years studying archaeology and no one had told us on one occasion that beavers even lived in England. And to actually see one up close and personal, we then found a skeleton dating back to the Bronze Age. You can imagine we were blown away. So that was my first encounter with a beaver. And it really struck me uh, at that point and ever since that um, as you all know well, but most people don't, but that we, we co-evolved with beavers. And as an archaeologist, I've looked most recently and reflected on the structures that we humans make. And I, one of the guys earlier on mentioned that they taught us to farm and to, and to build. Um, I agree, I absolutely agree. So if you look at, say, a chambered cairn, for example, um, in, in Western Europe, for those of you who um, aren't familiar, there are uh, long barrows and round barrows, and the long barrows have typically a chamber or a set of chambers within them. And they look remarkably like beaver lodges, as you can imagine. They're made of, of earth and rocks and sticks sometimes too. 
and when we look at the houses that our ancestors lived in as well. I've often wondered um, who gave us the idea to build a roundhouse that looks you know, very much uh, similar in structure to a beaver lodge. We have wattle and daub walls that are made of earth and sticks. We have um, gardening, and as we well know here in this audience, that um, beavers are avid gardeners. So a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the works that we tend not to associate with beavers, I would like to think that we, we learned a little bit from them. And, we, we evolved and lived on those, those lush wetlands where all the game came down to, to feed. And we just sat there and waited for some deer to pass and took a shot. Beaver did all the hard work for us. Now, I'm not suggesting beavers taught us everything. Of course, there are lots of wildlife, you know, whether it's a swallow's nest using mud to make a nest or a weaver bird teaching us how to make baskets. We are brilliant at copying. So um, I wonder whether we can use the beaver as our friend and also as a source of inspiration in the work that we're doing over the coming years, and I'm not going to say decades. Um, I feel a very strong sense of urgency, and I, I imagine that I'm not alone in that. The, uh, the main difference for me occurred 12 years ago when I became a dad, and having worked in the climate change and extinction business for quite a long time, um, it really only hit home properly that once my children had been born that I was going to be uh, facing and they were going to be facing what could be an extremely challenging future. However, 20 years ago when I really started working in this field of, of conservation and sustainable development, I genuinely believed we had time. And I'm afraid I don't anymore. That's all. I'd like to introduce you to Great Britain. Um, out of 218 countries in the world, where do you think Britain ranks in our state of nature? So one is not pristine, but pretty amazing, and 218 is pants. I'd like some numbers called out, please, loudly. Thank you, sir. 215. Ooh, that's pessimistic. Sorry, someone else? 200. Well, you've slightly spoiled mine. <laughs> it's 189. So we, we Brits are responsible for uh, quite a lot of stuff going on in the world historically, as I'm sure you're well aware. Many of us in the room are, are British descended or at least European descended. Uh, we're very good at offshoring. We're very good at offshoring our carbon. When we feel bad about our business, we pay others to grow a wind turbine or to grow trees. Uh, we offset our wealth. And that's not just in Britain, in America and other countries too. We, we send our money to tax havens. We're not very good, we Brits, um, I may say, at fixing our own problems. Even our offshoring of giving, we spend a fortune helping developing nations, and rightly so clearing up the mess that we made over the past two, three hundred years. And we still haven't really done a very good job at home. And I know my British colleagues in the room will resonate strongly with that. So here's some figures for you. And my talk doesn't have many, so it won't take long. Over the past few years, since the 1970s, I was born in 72, uh, we've lost 40% of our vertebrates. We've lost 60% of our invertebrates and 15% of species are now extinct in Great Britain. That's quite upsetting. 84% of our topsoil has been lost and even our government, the Department for Environment, has estimated that we only have 30 to 40 years of fertility left in our soil. These figures are very worrying but they are not unusual. There are parts of America, uh, Canada and Western Europe that are just as guilty of uh, nature degradation. In Britain we suffer from floods rather a lot. It won't surprise you uh, Americans in the audience that <laughs> we have quite a lot of rain in England and, uh, and the, rest of, uh, the rest of Britain and uh, using an example in 2015 we had five billion pounds worth of damage just for one year of floods. And this is now becoming the new norm. Uh, this year, uh, I have family and friends who've been affected in the north of England, in southern Wales, 
in Scotland and in southern England. And in fact, as I speak, the road outside my house is flooded. So these things are very real. The IPCC estimated two years ago that we had 12 years, so that's 10 years now, to limit our temperature increase by two degrees centigrade. Uh, we hit one degrees in 2018, and we've already hit well over 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And depending on where you are in the Northern Hemisphere, the last 18 years have been the hottest on record since they began in 1850. So floods and droughts and wildfires, species extinctions, sea level rise. I remember being in Miami not that long ago and being standard to know that Miami, the sea is literally flooding into the city there. I have no idea. Climate change is real and it's happening. And I, I don't need to convince you guys of that. I'm sure we all would agree with that. However, it's the, it's the, the, the immediacy. If we were a Syrian and we had been forced from our home, the way the newspapers report a, a terrible catastrophes like that, it's all about the politics and it's all about the money and it's all about you know, despotic leaders. But underneath it all, it is simple. There is no rain in Syria and no food. That's it. Add a few last, nasty human beings into the mix and then you get all the social unrest and warfare. But underneath it all, for decades now, the hotter parts of our earth are struggling and we are too. So I wonder how soon is it that we might experience a, a real catastrophe across the Northern Hemisphere? And I'm, I'm sorry to be a bit depressing about this, but I think it's really important to ground our work in reality and to work forwards towards solutions. Now, if we think about the, uh, the possibility of having an energy crisis with oil and gas becoming more expensive and running out, uh, the minerals that we require, the rare earths as they're called, they're well named, they are rare earths for making batteries for example. These technologies are not going to appear overnight and they're not going to, in my opinion, appear possibly in time for real difficulties for many people. So to rely on technology is, I think, a misnomer. It's, uh, it's going down the wrong path. We need technology, but we need nature more than anything. That's our work. So when we have an energy crisis and we then mix in for good measure a crop failure, if you lived in Turkey, last year the Turkish government was giving food handouts to people because of crop failure. That wasn't reported in the rest of Europe, but it happened. So if you mix all these things together, the likelihood of an economic crash happening quite quickly is, is very likely. They have happened and they always do. So if you add all this up and our emissions targets and our policies that are driving us towards them, we recognise, some of us, that we may have got the numbers wrong. There's uh, a few authors, a guy called Jem Bendel, uh, this guy I recommend you might read if you haven't already, uh, wrote about deep adaptation and he and a bunch of people from various universities in Britain have reassessed the figures that have been projected. And they point out, as some of us have been doing for quite a long time, that the figures that our climate emissions projections are based on don't include methane. They don't include the approximate 40 year time lag from the point at which emissions are released and when they affect us. I'll leave that one with you. As we've been reminded with uh, the coronavirus, we've already seen what can happen just simply from a bug. And that's affecting our stock markets already, it's affecting employment, and uh, it will affect travel uh, in, in many parts of the world. Who knows where it might go? So just to remind you that um, I, I think uh, water is key to our species and life on earth uh, in this new hothouse world that we find ourselves living in and it is water that we are all have in common in our work with beavers 
of course trees, of course broader riparian habitat, but ultimately we cannot live without water. And that's what excites me so much about these amazing creatures. So I'd like to, a, a, a hypothetical question, what do we need to do then to speed up the pace at which we can change and adapt to this hothouse world that we're living in? Well, I think, um, I think it's not a simple task, it's, but it is to reconnect people with each other and the rest of nature. And, and emphasis on the word rest of nature. I was very pleased to see David Attenborough in one of his programmes, I was just watching it last night actually, referring to the rest of nature. Many people don't think like that. We are nature. I wonder if it's possible for us scientists, again, made in brackets, small s, you guys, uh, PhD. I wonder if it's possible for us to be a little less, or, or I was going to say a little less objective. Don't be less objective, but be a bit more subjective. Allow ourselves to feel our work more. I don't know if any of you have ever studied Wolfgang von Goethe, who's well known for his writing, amongst many things, but he was also an incredible scientist in the 1700s. And he taught about science and the study of life as being a process of coming into being. And it's an, an emergent process. It's biological. And when we ask ourselves, what is a oak tree? We tend to imagine a resplendent canopy and thick trunk, whereas an acorn is just as much an oak. So I wonder whether being able to feel our way into our work a bit more and allow ourselves to be able to express what's actually going on inside us. When we write our papers and we report them, when we publicise the work that we and our colleagues do, is it possible for us to show a bit more of our humanity in what we do? And that's not meant to be a criticism in anyone's work in this room or anywhere else. But we all, we all know that this, this, the peer review process and the way that science and publications work it, 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 it's drummed into us in a way dehumanising and objectifying nature. So if we're to reconnect and help reconnect people with the rest of nature and each other, then we need to do it too, within the beaver community, within the broader science and conservation community as well. We need to give space to nature. There's no news there. You all well understand that, I'm sure. And ultimately, from our point of view, we need to allow rivers to breathe across the floodplains and the headwaters again. We need systemic nature-based solutions. The problem we face is systemic and it's incredibly complicated and no one has one, one size fits all solution. But if we use nature and work with nature, and without sounding too utilitarian about it and beavers particularly, because we're very good at sounding utilitarian, we should be using these nature-based solutions to clean our water and our land. So this is why we've set up the Beaver Trust. It was actually going to be called Natural Trust originally, but if you know anything about Britain, we have a large organisation called National Trust. So when I sent the application in, I got a very firm no. Um, but that's okay, because our first programme was and is Beavers. Uh, it was going to be called Main Street. I like that. It was my idea. But so, Beavers and Beaver Trust has evolved uh, in a very, very short period of time. And, and I have to say, I am humbled, I really mean I'm humbled to be here amongst you guys because I'm an interloper. I'm, you know, I'm a newbie. I'm a sort of, I don't know, social entrepreneur or something like that. I don't know what you call me, but I'm trying to fix problems and help people do things together. I'm not a real Beaver person like you guys. I'm trying to be and I'm learning fast. But uh, to, to be able to be around you and learn from you and, and obviously the guys over there from, from Britain and, and from Europe who I see more. Um, it, it is, it's, it's, it's a remarkable journey that everyone's been on. Um, however, we, we need to speed up. So I think that we have uh, a common, and, and you, you have, I've already heard the term catchments already today, there's a common understanding between us, but not that many others, that a catchment-based approach to our riparian habitats and our waterways 
is the way forwards. We, we can't keep working in isolation, we can't keep, in, uh, and using Britain as a, and particularly England as an example, England and Wales actually, using that as an example, um, we have wonderful trials that we've done over, over the years, um, and they by through necessity have been isolated and, and quite small. Um, we've had the wild releases that weren't necessarily um, permitted, but are nonetheless very welcome. And, um, and, and the, the dots are beginning to join up, but we're a long way to go. If you come across here, across the pond, from state to state, we see huge variety in the level of public awareness, in the level of professionalism within the beaver or non-beaver community, and the facilities and the support provided by governments, NGOs, businesses and communities. So there's a huge disparity between our states, our countries, our locales. We set the Beaver Trust up to try and help resolve that. So we see ourselves as um, conveners and facilitators and catalysts. So we will do some of the doing in our work, but we are here to help bring resources and support to the people, you guys, and particularly those in, in Britain at the moment, we're new, we're not going to go too international quite yet. Um, we would like to be able to help others to succeed in their work. We also, um, we need to stimulate demand for beavers, and of course we've already touched on a few talks before about education, and um, it's, the, it's the public that we need to work with most, but the public, remember, does include people who run organisations and cities and governments. They're still the public too. They have kids. They have, they have houses. They have houses that flood. So it is, it is a public outreach and empowering of people generally that's required. And we, as a Beaver community, need to, even more than we have already, work together and to do it with a sense of urgency to help our communities build resilience. So I'm, I had written to myself a, uh, a, another unnecessary question like the one I started off with, and I'm not even going to bother asking it, but it was, it was about how many of you in the audience are involved in working with beavers. Um, I think I found out that that's pretty much 100%. So, the progress so far, um, without trying to blow hot air up your asses, uh, there, there, there are heroes and heroines in the room, and I should think most people will fit within that. Um, and, and actually, some of the work that's been done by people is, has been quite risky as well, and quite, you know, whether it's their professional uh, reputation, the research they've been doing, or some of the activities they've been up to, or, or the, the policy, or whatever it is they've been doing, there's been true heroism involved in the work. And, and why is that? Because we all feel this animal, the beaver, is so unique. It is so extraordinary in its working, it, it truly is an ecosystem, as Heidi Perriman said. And what a humbling experience to be able to work with that animal and with people like you to be able to help bring back the beaver. So, we have research that's been done so far, uh, whether it's on the impacts on wildlife and waterways, uh, the land itself, and indeed livelihoods. We have trial reintroduction projects in countries like uh, England, Wales and Scotland and parts of Europe um, where beavers have been long absent and are now returning. And huge amounts have been learned from those, books have been written, papers have been written, and the communications now is, 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 is quite extraordinary in some cases. You will know um, that, that in Britain, um, Duncan Fields mentioned earlier about the River Otter Beaver Trial results that have just been published. It's an extraordinary piece of work by um, wildlife trusts and universities involved and many others indeed, the people in, uh, are sitting on that table over there. And it is, it is remarkable, um, but it's also frustrating for, for, for some of us uh, Brits, in that we're doing work that should have been done a long time ago, no, through no fault of our own. Um, but we're working in an environment where we're having to relearn everything all over again. Does that sound familiar? There's something weird about this animal and its ecology that whatever your country or your state, you have to start from the bloody beginning. Why? What scares us so much about this animal? It's remarkable. So when we talk to fishing associations in Britain, uh, Duncan's just published a fantastic new paper um, about uh, salmonids and the impact of beavers. I, I saw a private communication from someone who I can't name, but um, I wasn't meant to see it. And uh, it's, it's, it's very complimentary about the research 
But then when it comes down to it, the person is saying, oh yes, but it, it's Norway. It's a little part of Norway. It's a small, it's a small piece of so, oh, It's an Atlantic salmon, exactly the same as the salmon in Britain. It's just a few hundred miles away. So whilst there's been a huge amount of um, progress made and a huge amount of research, and no doubt there is more research to be done, there's a huge amount of duplication of effort. And I wonder how many of us here have done research or written papers or involved in communications or projects when you've looked at yourself in the mirror and you thought that great point. Haven't I seen this done somewhere before? It's very frustrating, but it's the situation we find ourselves in. So how can we now exemplify, sorry, um, um, uh, magnify that work to scale it? There are also management, management techniques. Uh, of course, um, Skip uh, and, and, and many others have been involved in trialing and developing, uh, whether they're flow devices, tree guards. Um, I was speaking to a guy who runs a, an estate in California, a pistachio farm, and um, beavers turned up 50 kilometers down a dry creek and uh, ate the pistachio trees, unfortunately. And uh, their way of protecting those trees was by painting on cayenne pepper which was very successful. There's also the community engagement and education side of things. And um, needless to say, there's a huge amount of work being done, but, but dare I say it, not enough. And again, sporadic. There are lots of communities that have had a lot of attention and support to, to relearn how to live with beavers, but there are uh, many that have not. So what are the challenges that we face then? If we, we, we've identified this as a big problem, we have an amazing opportunity with our friends the beavers and, and the riparian um, restoration more generally. Uh, what are the challenges? Well, um, perhaps one of the greatest challenges is that while beavers are in our history, they're not in our culture in many places. I spotted um, on the way here from the airport a couple of days ago, a, a signpost said Beaver Down Road, just a few miles down the road from here. Where I live in England, there's a, uh, a town called Beversbrook. So there is, if we go back, plenty of evidence and, and connections with beavers. Um, another challenge, along with the fact that we've forgotten that beavers are in our culture and in our lives and how to live with them in many cases, and of course it's a broad sweeping statement, I do appreciate there are lots of people who are not in that situation. Um, we also have a very outdated socio socioeconomic system, and that's really one of the biggest challenges that we face as a community of, um, of, of, of practitioners. What can we do when we know the system is partly to blame? So if we look at, um, and this is true anywhere, um, land ownership. Um, private interests of landowners and the borders between farms, communities, uh, rivers don't recognise borders, and, and nor do beavers. Policy is inconsistent from state to state and country to country. And farmers in many places are still incentivised for productivity at all costs and are allowed to pollute. There are many clashes with infrastructure and livelihoods and sadly, as we all know, persecution does still exist and is in some cases actively encouraged. We also have fundamental issues that we often forget. If I think back to the 70s when I was cruising around in my dad's Ford Cortina, the uh, the, fly, but the flies on the windscreen, having to wipe the screen every few minutes. Uh, genuinely, I was struck this summer, last summer, having a long, long journey along the motorway, and I literally did not have to clean my screen once. I went hundreds of miles. That's wrong. Things have changed. And shifting baseline syndrome, as some people call it, is very real and very present for many of us, probably for all of us. What we thought was normal in our youth was not. It was normal to our parents and our grandparents and so on. So every year and every generation that goes by, things change and we forget that what we've lost. We also have ecological tidiness disorder. <laughs> Who thought of that name? Ecological tidiness disorder. If you want to go near where I live in Berkshire, you just have to drive along any road and you'll see hedgerows, which we used to be very proud of in Britain, as being full of life and really scruffy and resplendent with nature are now clipped within an inch of their lives with these little straight lines, as if all the local farmers have competitions of who 
who can get as closest to horizontal. Um, and it probably does happen, I should imagine. Uh, there's bound to be some composition going on somewhere like that. We, we, we have this irresistible urge to try and tidy everything up around us, whether it's mowing our lawns again and again and again. And literally, when our mower comes along, it's sucking the life out once every week or two. Uh, why do we do this to our, our gardens? Why do we do it to our verges and our public spaces? So ecological tidiness is, is a, is a uh, it's become ingrained in our society. And if I don't know about you, but if we go back 20 years or so, I wouldn't say that at all. I really wouldn't. Yes, mowing lawns and things, but things like clipping hedgerows and having this insane idea that everything has to be meticulous um, is quite a recent thing, but it's suddenly become very normal. So, as I mentioned a minute ago, many of us have forgotten what it's like to live with beavers and to live with wetlands. And we really do struggle with their unruly, messy and disruptive ways. They are truly wild, obviously. And even in an enclosure like the uh, Cornwall Beaver Project that, um, that uh, my colleague Chris Jones runs, uh, he's a co-director of Beaver Trust, that's a very small two, three acre site. And it's fantastic. It's absolutely buzzing with life. Uh, we, we saw uh, in, the, in the past couple of years, we've seen uh, six new bird records and one of them was, um, we saw a dozen spotted flycatchers, uh, which trust me are pretty, are pretty rare and certainly a first for that part of Cornwall uh, in a day. Uh, we're all, all sorts of wildlife that would never have been there before, but it's messy. And we love that, but not everybody does. So um, the, uh, the funding side of things, just very briefly, I won't go on about it too, too much at all, but if you look at, um, NERC, NERC as we call it in Britain, it's one of the main funding bodies, um, you have a roughly 7% success rate to get funding if you're an environmental project. It's not very hopeful, is it? And that's one of the big funders. Most of the giving uh, philanthropy in Britain and uh, America's a bit, bit more linked, linked towards the environment, but most of our funding goes towards international development and uh, humanitarian work, which is very, very important. But the amount of money that is allocated for environmental projects and work is very small, as we know. And that does lead to competition between us all, something that none of us want, but we have to. And that's not just our community, but all scientific communities and conservation communities. There's not enough money. And I, went, I mentioned earlier on about offshoring, and I think that, uh, that has something to do with it. We, we like to fund uh, development and, and sort of supporting and clearing up the mess we've created elsewhere, but not so good at doing it at home. Uh, I mentioned duplication of effort. Uh, we Brits, there are 26 European countries that have beavers, and uh, England is last. It still isn't a recognised native species, as Duncan mentioned earlier. And, um, that is, I hope, going to change in the course of the next few months or, or year, maybe longer, um, depending on how government responds. But there are parts of, of the world, we need to remember, where beavers are still not regarded as being native. And I know that from conversations with colleagues in California, and I'm sure there's other parts of states where similar issues are, are, are struggled with there. Um, I, I'd also like to, uh, uh, dare I say it, mention that like beavers, we practitioners are, can be a little territorial. Now, as, as newcomers to this um, wonderful world of beavers, I mentioned earlier on about duplication of effort um, and, and it being a necessity, um, sadly, um, but a necessity. Um, we, we also, like our beaver friends, are, um, uh, can, can be quite uh, protective, and rightly so, of, our, of the work that we do and, um, and, and sustaining our incomes. Um, that's nothing extraordinary and particular to beaver practitioners. That's true of anybody working in science and conservation. And it's not our fault. It's because of the lack of funding and it's because things are so competitive. It's something we should recognise, I think. So what can we do to normalise beavers again within our communities? Um, one idea, and, and I don't think it's particularly new, but, uh, but very, very, very important, is that there seems to be a distinct lack of vision that everybody buys into. That when I say everybody, I mean the powers that be, the people who have influence within uh, not just a local community, but in a, in a nation state, or in the case of the states, a state. We need strategies that will then allow us to deliver that vision. What is our vision to normalise beavers in a country? 
Um, I haven't had the pleasure of uh, speaking with Gerhard yet, um, but I'm sure you're all well aware of the wonderful work that's been done over the years in Bavaria. And to use that as just one example, I'm not going to go into the detail because I don't know enough about it, but there's extraordinary work that's happened there over many years that demonstrates that by allowing rivers to breathe and having buffer zones, admittedly not that wide, but in many cases reasonably wide, that takes the pressure off right here in habitat. It means farmers can't plough right up to the edge. There's less pollution and runoff going into the river. It's common sense, really. This has now been considered in Britain um, and in the English government, uh, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, ELM, is going to be probably replacing the payments that come from Europe currently. Uh, you'll know about Brexit and uh, you'll know that our common agricultural policy and basic payment systems for farmers is all about to change. That's good. It gives us an opportunity to be able to incentivise and reward people for stewarding the land better. So rather than incentivising productivity, as I mentioned earlier, and yield per acre, it's more about public payment for public goods. That's exciting. I like that. And it's not very complicated either. If you were to, uh, say for example, create a 10, 20 metre buffer either side of a, a, a river or stream, and the farmer was not allowed to farm that anymore, and it was allowed to naturally regenerate, maybe have some planting and of course some beavers, then why not reward and incentivise that farmer for doing so? The quality of, uh, of, of um, their life and of their livelihoods will improve, as will those people downstream who suffer less from flooding and pollution and others. Um, another thing that Bavaria shows us, and, and, and indeed other places too, is being able to support local communities with expertise and making sure that uh, communities are well in advance of beavers returning or becoming higher in number that they impact them, that those, those people actually know how to live with beavers. And if there's a problem, which does happen of course, that someone's on the end of the phone and can come and visit if necessary. I had my first visit to a farm very recently with two uh, delightful uh, farming couple who were, who were close to retirement and they were both devastated and delighted that beavers had turned up on their land. They were also quite surprised because there weren't really meant to be any beavers in that part of England, but um, they, they turn up in places. And so um, they proudly showed me their new beaver dams and asked me what I would do. Now of course I always emphasise in this I am not the expert, but I can introduce you to people who are. However, one of the things I really noticed was the flooding that had been caused on their land was to be... Um, I realise I've spoken a lot more than I was planning. Thank you for the five minutes. Um, the, 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 the land was going to be um, uh, possibly result in loss of tree cover that they had been paid by the government to plant in the first place. So what would the government do? So there we have Elm and incentivising people. We need to um, increase the supply of beavers in places that are not enough beavers, and um, we need to make sure that those um, that those are genetically diverse populations, disease free, and um, and, 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 and have the right um, animal husbandry, and are, and are looked after carefully. And um, the, the education of people, whether it's from school into the workplace and communities, is absolutely essential. So very briefly then, um, Beavers Without Borders is a new alliance which you're all invited to consider joining or at least following. Um, humbly, uh, I've said that word before and I really mean it, we are not the experts, we're just conveners and there's already I think about 40 people who are people you will know, some of you in the room, who've signed up and have said yes we, we believe in Beavers and we want to try and help um, each other. This is an alliance of practitioners, just to be clear. And, and that also can include filmmakers as well, policy makers too, but people who work within the world of beavers, working together. So we, we would like to help others to replicate and scale what works. We'd like to, uh, we, we believe we have most of the answers and expertise as a community, and it is now down to us to try and scale those things up. That we need to do all the things we've talked about previously, about whether it's training uh, and, and whether it's uh, collaborating through um, our, our sharing of learning, and, um, and sharing stories that actually really tug at the heartstrings. So it's not only the science papers that need to be published, it's normal people who walk their dog past the beaver dam 
this is a normal farmer um, who speaks to another farmer and, and shares their experience of living with beavers or a fisher person speaking to another fisher person, um, not just an outsider. And then um, from a, a, a collaborative network point of view, if we were to use the mycorrhizal network that exists in our soils everywhere, like you know, linking plants, then we would, I would, we would like to suggest that this alliance might feed each other and do it selflessly so that we can face the challenges and offer messages of hope and abundance. So um, finally then, the beaver is very well known to us all, but not to many or not to everybody by any certain means. And we see the beaver very, it's very much a figurehead for a campaign. The beaver fits it perfectly. It is an ecosystem creator. It is a bringer of life and it helps solve our problems. So we would like to suggest that when we consider the beaver and our campaigns, we're not just talking about the species of animal, we're talking about it as a keystone creator of habitats and bringer of life. And one that can lead us by example. So finally then, to inject urgency in our work, that's what I would like to encourage uh, we do in our, within our organisation and, uh, and within each other, if I may say so. We, we, we have done so much as a community, and you guys, many years before I got involved, that is, it is extraordinary, but we need to do so much more, we need to do it quickly. So when we leave this uh, conversation, I would love to go and have a chat with anybody who would like to talk about how we can speed things up. And with a very short period of time that we have left, could I invite Emily and Sarah and Jacob to come up. Hi everyone, I am Emily Fairfax. I am a assistant professor at California State University, Channel Islands. Um, and I have just like one major word of advice and like lesson that I've learned in my career so far working with beavers and working with what I affectionately call my beaver people. Um, and that's that the words you choose when you do these kinds of things really matters. Um, so I came into earth science from out of field. I was in physics before this, and the worst thing that happened to me was having everyone around me just use words I didn't know. Um, so jargon was really hard for me. It didn't matter who I was talking to. It didn't matter who was other scientists. Like, I knew I was smart, but I didn't know what the lithosphere was. I couldn't even say it for like two years. I just like avoided it altogether. Um, and that's the same thing when I talk about beavers with people. And I have to stop and think, like, what is common knowledge? And so when I ask people, you know, who here has actually seen a beaver? Even in this room, I'm guessing that every hand is going to go up. Um, and so generalize that out to much more diverse audiences, and a lot of times there's no hands up. People haven't seen a beaver. And so I draw one on the board, and I can be the first one to tell you I can't draw very well. Um, it's always a circle with a little tail coming out and stick legs, but that's all I need to break the ice. And then choosing the words that I'm using carefully. So thinking about what I'm saying, why I'm saying it. My favorite science communication exercise is to summarize what you do, but only use words that have four letters or less. And so in case you didn't know, beaver is more than four letters. So that makes it kind of challenging from the get-go. So is stream, so is creek, so is brook, so is river, so is water. I don't know why hydrology was like every word has to have more than four, but it made it hard for me. Um, but I like to start with that exercise because it takes everyone back down to the same level. It really levels that playing field for all of you. Um, I'm happy to talk more about science communication. I have a little stop motion video that some of you may have seen that I'm also happy to talk about at any point in time. Um, but as a takeaway, my research, for example, is that big pond rats trap rain in the land, slow it down, and stop fire. So you can take whatever you do and make it that concise too. Thanks. totally out of time, um, so I don't need to say anything now. You'll see my film uh, tonight, and I'll give a little intro there. I'm actually going to um, play Emily's stop motion before the film as like our preview. Um, and then I'll also be able to introduce Jacob and his work with the Beaver Coalition and Rob over there. So we'll, we'll pick up that train later tonight. Uh, but my presentation on Thursday afternoon is all about starting to think about communication, how we as scientists need to be taking advantage of every opportunity, every Uber driver, every bartender, every person sitting next to you on the airplane. These are all chances to share stories. It's not just when you have an official interview with a media outlet or you're giving a formal presentation. These are all times just to start sharing our stories. So we'll get into more of that later. Thanks.